Appreciate your being here. <clears throat> I, uh, I was drinking a cup of coffee when I was called to come up here. I wasn't really planning on drinking a cup of coffee. For some reason, uh, one of my students from last year handed me a cup of coffee, and I can't understand that because he didn't get a particularly good grade from me. Like, <laughs> I thought that. Okay, you got it. <laughs> I don't think he slipped me anything. We'll find out shortly. Our, our, our task today is to explore the conversion of the Apostle Paul. I'm going to try to remember as much as possible in, in the course of discussing him to call him uh, Saul, because that's mostly what we're thinking about today is his life as Saul. I would venture to say that the conversion of Saul of Tarsus is one of the most noteworthy events recorded in the New Testament. I would say that even if Saul had not eventually become a preacher of the gospel, even had he not been called to be an apostle, even had he not become the most influential of all the apostles, the man uh, more responsible than any other one man for bringing the gospel to the Gentile world. The conversion of Saul of Tarsus is outstanding because here you have somebody who is the most uh, notorious enemy of Christianity who is converted to the church by the power of the gospel and if that can happen it seems to me that the possibilities are virtually limitless that the gospel has the power to convert its worst enemy. At the very beginning it seems that God targeted Saul for conversion. He took a special interest in the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. Now, we cannot with complete confidence go into God's agenda and say, I know exactly what God was thinking on, in all the things that he did, but I think that there are some probable implications that we can uh, conclude from what happened here. You see, one of the things that's interesting is when God is talking about Saul and his conversion, it's almost as though he takes it for granted that he will convert. And God can do that, of course, because he is an omniscient God. He does know the future as well as he knows the past. I personally think that's one of the reasons that prophecies are sometimes, in fact, quite often spoken in the past tense. It is as though it has already happened. And when God is discussing the promise that he had given, actually Paul wrote this uh, to Abraham, the last part of Romans chapter 4 and verse 17 describes these two qualities of God. It reads, who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. So when God was looking at Saul, he knew that once Saul was confronted with the evidence, that in fact he would become obedient to it. And so you even have the omniscient nature of God revealed in some things that are said there because Ananias, Ananias had some serious reservations about going and meeting with uh, Saul of Tarsus. Isn't this the man that we've heard of who has done all these terrible things to the church? And then God responds to him in Acts chapter 9 and verses 15 and 16 by saying uh, he is a chosen vessel. And I'm going to show him the things that he must suffer, which is an interesting revelation that he gave to him, but God was saying to Ananias, it's going to happen, and there's no doubt about that. If Saul is to be converted, there's no doubt that he's going to have the ability to do great things on behalf of the church. Here's my question. Were Saul's unique abilities unique only to him and all of the world? That is, were there other Jewish men who had training in the disciplines of the law and philosophy who would have been able to preach and defend the truth to the same groups of people that Saul would be able to? And it seems to me, for whatever it's worth, that it's unlikely that he was the one man in all of the world that had these capabilities. So we can ask, I think, 
If that presumption is correct, why then did God do the things that he did in order to convert Saul? And a likely answer is, again, that God knew that he was the man who would in fact convert. There were other people who had great talents. But it, in all probability, they were not targeted because God knew that that was a blind alley. They would not convert given the opportunity. Saul, on the other hand, would. Now, there are some other things about this conversion and God's special targeting of Saul that I think speak to his nature. One of those is his concern with individuals. Now, again... I hope that we all understand uh, we cannot anticipate experiencing a similar event to what Paul or Saul experienced on the road to Damascus. But it does remind us that we serve a God who is intimately concerned with the billions on earth. To him they are not just a mass of humanity, but he knows them by name, just as he knew Saul by name. Jesus reminds us in Matthew chapter 10 and verses 29 and 30, he said, Are not two uh, sparrows sold for a farthing or a copper coin? And one of them shall not fall to the ground without your father, or the New King James, without outside of his will. And he said, The very hairs of your head are numbered. For some of us, that's not so great a feat. For others, it's something only God could do. But it reminds us that as God looks at this world, and we all know for God so loved the world, but again, it's not just a, a, a concept with him. It's not just a, a, a matter of a, a picture of a globe. But in fact, he knows the individuals of this earth. It's also a reminder to us concerning our current efforts in the church with regard to evangelism. It reminds us that the people who are hearing the gospel and the people who need to hear the gospel are more than just a, a map or a report or even a missionary slide. These are real individuals with real problems and struggles and value. And God sees them that way. We need to as well. Saul is a reminder of this. He wasn't just a number. He was a person. It was this quality, this wonderful divine quality of God that I think that he was emphasizing to Jonah as Jonah had given the message reluctantly. God then said to him with regard to his attitude about Nineveh in Jonah chapter 4 and verse 11. He said, should I not have pity on these 120,000 don't know the right hand from their left? In other words, Jonah, you ought to be more like me. These are people that we're talking about that are slated for destruction, and you don't care. But God does. When we meet Saul, when the Bible reader is first introduced to him, one can scarcely imagine a less likely candidate for conversion than he was. Having heard the marvelous testimony of Stephen at the close of Acts chapter 7, instead of responding to it, he is the ringleader in the lynching of Stephen. After the Bible takes a detour in its history in Acts chapter 8, it returns to Saul at the beginning of Acts chapter 9. And now he is compelled to travel abroad in order to persecute Christians doesn't sound like somebody that you expect will be receptive to the preaching of the gospel, does it? But there was a reason for this. And the reason is that according to his own later testimony, he was honestly mistaken. He said, I've lived in an all good conscience before God to this day. Acts chapter 23 and verse 1. Acts chapter 26 and verse 9. I thought that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus. And yet, when you think about that, you kind of have to ask yourself, how is it possible that he had not been previously confronted with this evidence? Because what had happened with Jesus of Nazareth seems to have been a, a, a message, a, a report that had spread to virtually everybody. 
Paul himself would later say, as we heard this last lesson in Acts chapter 26 and verse 26, these things were not done in a corner. Or perhaps you recall what happened with Jesus who was unrecognizable evidently to two of his disciples in Luke chapter 24 and verse 18 and as they're walking along and as they're discussing the events of Passover weekend there's but one topic of discussion and that was what happened to Jesus and they said are you the only person in Jerusalem that hasn't heard about this and so you ask well if if it's the case that Paul was Saul was honestly mistaken had never been confronted with the evidence exactly how was this possible J.W. McGarvey in his commentary on page 169 suggests that in fact the answer was that he was not there at the time. That in fact uh, it is very probable that he was back home at Cilicia and had only recently returned and now having returned, having uh, become a very prominent young man in the Jewish faith, he has been briefed by unprincipled liars. And because of his belief that he ought to do the things that were right and good in the eyes of God, he set out to do what he had been misinformed to do. That seems like a, a fairly reasonable explanation to me. You know, the ignorance of Saul of Tarsus Something that helps you to understand him a little better, I think. It was a mitigating factor for him. We don't mean to suggest that in ignorance one can be saved. But nonetheless, uh, he himself later would say, I obtain mercy. In 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 13, he said, I formerly was a, a persecutor, an insolent man. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly and in unbelief. Now the way this mercy worked with Saul, it wasn't a case where he, he received it and immediately he was saved just because he was ignorant. But he received the opportunity to try to make amends with his life for a life that he would describe in the same chapter, 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 16, in which he was the chief of sinners. One wonders... Given all this that I'm telling you about the time that, that Saul was uh, an infidel and that it was because of ignorance, given all that, one wonders why he was not affected in some way by the death of Stephen. I don't know. Maybe he was in some way. Maybe that was part of the preparation process which would lead him to make a change a very short while later. But he had witnessed this beautiful martyrdom of Stephen. I don't know. Maybe he passed it off as the sad devotion of the deceived. And if that's the case, that was ironic indeed. But what was it about Saul that made him different than, than the innumerable other infidels who lived and died and never believed. What was it that made him different? What was it? As I've suggested already, there may have been a dozen or a hundred other Saul's in the area. What was it that made him make the change once he was confronted with the truth? I think there are a couple of things. And again, these go to who he was even before he was converted. It seems to me that Saul of Tarsus had a passion for the truth. And he also had a keen awareness of sin. Now obviously he was misinformed about what those things were. He didn't know what truth was. He didn't know what sin was. At least what some of it was. But when he was confronted with it, it seems that he wanted to do the right thing. In a word, conscience. Saul had a conscience. It was hard to see it given the circumstances, but Saul of Tarsus had a conscience. My dad used to say the most dangerous man in any community is not one who's killed another human being, but one who's killed his conscience because you can't reach that man. And Saul of Tarsus had killed human beings, but he did have a conscience. He believed that what was true ought to be 
sought and honored and furthermore defended. That made it possible to reach you. And then there was this matter of sin. Based on some of his later writings, you can, I think, see the way that Saul was, in a sense, tortured by his, by his own imperfections. Romans chapter 7 and verse 24, Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of sin? Unlike the cold-hearted hypocrites of his own Jewish sect, and I don't think you can say that uh, Saul was the typical Pharisee. He really believed in what he was doing. And he believed that this, these sins, these imperfections of his own, that those, well, they ought to be abandoned. Let me suggest to you that there are some possibilities here. I'm certainly no prophet, and I, I am not making a, an ironclad prediction of any kind. But let me make a suggestion. In our day and time, we have some people among us in the United States who are of much concern to many people. Islamic fundamentalists. In the Western world, Islamic fundamentalism, again, radicalism is, beco is becoming a more and more increasing problem. In parts of Europe, they would consider it a crisis. Now, what do we do about that? Well, from the political point of view, people might begin to talk about border control and immigration control and things like that. That's not what I'm here to talk about. What I'm here to suggest to you is that here are a group of people who like Saul, believe that truth should be sought and honored and defended, and who are keenly aware of sin and believe that it ought to be avoided. Maybe some of these folks can be taught and converted. It's interesting to me that one of the uh, fastest growing segments of Islam is in prison populations. And one of the people that has converted a great number of convicts is a fellow who has a message that is sort of half psychotic and half fundamental. And I'm talking about the leader of the nation of Islam. And I'm telling you, his message, uh, <clears throat> if you take him at face value, somebody needs to put him in a straitjacket and lock him up somewhere. But here's the part of his message that I find fascinating. Regarding morals, Louis Farrakhan is about as straight-laced as anybody you will find. While middle America's version of Christianity over the past however many decades, has decided in order to reach people, we need to water this down and we need to make it as not objectionable as we possibly can. We need to embrace just about every kind of immorality that there is. And the more we do it, the less ground we gain and the more ground we lose, and then we'll do it some more. Even in the church, it has become the philosophy of the day to say, let's make our message as much like everybody else's as we possibly can. And I keep wondering, why in the world do they want it then? Farrakhan goes to what most people would consider the very dregs of society, the people who have done the very worst things, and he says, you will not father children out of wedlock. Middle America's version of Christianity says, we can't tell anybody that. That's judgmental. You'll never find anybody as judgmental as a, as a fundamentalist Islam, or a practitioner of fundamentalist Islam. And yet, they're making converts because here are people who have never had any standards, no rules, nothing whatsoever, and they're being given purpose in life, direction in life, and real standards. And it's resonating. Strange to me that so many people in America today have this 
odd, tolerant view of Islam and this odd, tolerant view of such issues as gay marriage. And once again, <clears throat> you, think, you think conservative Christian groups, and I'm using that in the widest possible term, but you think conservative Christian groups are tough on gay marriage, you ought to listen to fundamentalist Islam. But the bottom line is this. There are people out there who are lost in sin, who are infidels, who do not believe in Jesus Christ, but who have a conscience, but who lack teaching. Which brings us to the opening of Saul's heart and mind. Saul had a pure heart, but his mind had been misinformed. The Bible sometimes uses hearts and, and minds interchangeably. For instance, in Acts chapter 8 and verse 22, uh, Simon the sorcerer was told, repent of the thought of your heart. Romans chapter 10 and verse 10, with the heart man believeth. And we, that is people in general, sometimes get this idea that the heart has its own agenda and it's, it's a, a, a way of thinking and a, and a direction that's entirely different from what our minds know to be true. And unfortunately for some who follow their hearts into sin, that may be true. But that's not what God wants from us. What God wants from our hearts and minds is that the two work together producing conviction. Somebody might ask concerning the, the opening of heart, Saul's heart and mind, wouldn't everybody be converted if he had an experience like that of Saul on the road to Damascus? No. The answer is no. They would not. What about the other people on that road to Damascus? What happened to them? If they were affected, the Bible never tells us. Well, they didn't hear the message. <laughs> they heard something. They saw a light and they heard a disembodied voice speaking in a language they didn't understand. But you would think after something like that happened, they might have a conversation with Saul. What did we just see? Why didn't they convert? I trust the testimony of Abraham. The Bible tells us in the conversation between the rich man and Abraham, a conversation that went across the great gulf, in which he requested, send Lazarus back. They'll believe. My brothers will believe if he comes back from the dead. And in verse 31 of Luke chapter 16, Abraham disputed that. He said they had Moses and the prophets. If they'll not believe then, they will not believe even though one arose from the dead. And they won't. You know how I know that? Somebody did. That was Jesus. Everybody should have believed on account of that, and they didn't. But in the case of Saul, that experience worked exactly the way that it was designed to. That unique experience of Saul, what it did was it corrected his thinking. And when his thinking was corrected, because he had a pure heart, he was able then to act on it. There's a lesson there too. We sometimes get confused about all of this. How so? If we don't see conversion, sometimes, we, and, and, and maybe this is the problem sometimes, I'm not saying it's not, but sometimes we falsely focus on either the message or the messenger. And we forget that even Jesus didn't convert everybody there still must be a receptive heart at the end of the day. It doesn't matter what light somebody sees, it doesn't matter what voice they hear, if their hearts aren't receptive, they're not going to convert. And brethren, conversion is an option. And a lot of people opt no. When we consider what happened to him, it seems to me that we need to spend some time thinking about the value of chastisement in the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. Saul 
was evidently a rising star in the Jewish religion. And it's hard to reach somebody for whom life is going well. And I suppose that few of us would pray to God, God, make things really tough on me. But the truth is, most of us would be blessed by a prayer like that. Many of us have things so well in this life that we don't see the need for God. We have so insulated ourselves from spiritual things that the message can't get through. And the Bible tells us in Mark chapter 12, verse 37, it was the common people who heard him gladly. And James said in James chapter 2 and verse 5 that God hath chosen the poor of this world rich in faith. And the prodigal son was not prepared to go home until he found himself coveting the pig's feed. Luke chapter 15 verses 14 through 19. And then there's what the Hebrews writer said about the matter of chastisement in Hebrews chapter 12 and verses 4 through 11. And he indicated to us that sometimes, and we would not argue that every time this is the case, but sometimes when difficult things happen to us, it's supposed to be a divine wake-up call. Again, not every time. But sometimes that might be the case, and sometimes those are the best things that will happen to us. I remember hearing one time about a farmer who approached a mule. He had a feed sack in one hand and a two before in the other. He waited until the mule wasn't looking, and he whacked him upside the head as hard as he could <clears throat> and then put the feed bag under his nose. Somebody said, why do you do that? He said, I've got to get his attention before I feed him. I hope that we're brighter than mules, but... Uh, Sometimes, afraid not. And I suppose that it would also be true that before God allows uh, things to happen to us, like happened to Saul, that he has probably exhausted his means of communication with us. But chastisement can be very valuable to us. What happened to Saul? You ever thought about what he was thinking because I think it's important that we remember he spent three days in Damascus. Now somebody had to lead him into town because he was blind. That's a frightening and a humble experience, humbling experience. Somebody had to lead him into town and there he is. And here's something else, folks. God didn't say you're going to get your sight back. That would make a big difference to me. So for the next three days, the Bible says he's fasting, he's praying. And these are not a good three days. Because not only is it that blindness and wondering what's going to happen with me in my life, it's also the sudden realization as his life has been turned upside down that he is spiritually blind, that he is not right with God. That was hard. That was tough. No, it wasn't a good, it wasn't a good thing that happened to him. But you know what? That's true of every conversion. I think there's a powerful lesson here for us. It is regrettable that many Christians are more concerned about the injured feelings of the lost than they are that those people understand that they're lost. I'm not talking about excusing unkind and, and callous and, and unthinking statements that just hurt people. That's not what I'm talking about at all. But there's a trend in today's church that seems to be saying we'll reach more people and we'll convert people, but in the process, they'll go from this religious body to this one without any pain at all in that process. They'll, they'll be saved outside the church and we'll bring them in the church and they'll be saved. I want you to know something. Saul did not go from one flawed religious body into another. He had to come to the conclusion that he was dead wrong 
And he was blind. It's ironic he had to be blinded in order to see the light. But people today are convinced, many of them, unfortunately, that they can make that happen without at some point someone coming to the very painful realization, I am lost. And I'm here to tell you that such conversions are a farce. They aren't conversions at all. I was in college. I had a friend from Cameroon, Africa. And early on in the school year, now he was not a member of the Lord's Church. He was a believer in Christ. He was a member of a human organization. Little had been said, although he's going to church services with us over those first few weeks, until one evening he stopped by my room, and he was upset. And here's why he was upset. He had walked by a football game. Uh, I think maybe it was a Monday night game, whatever. But he walked by, and, and other people were watching the game, and he's... He watched it for a little bit, and he didn't know much about American football, but the Washington Redskins were playing. And uh, he said, I don't know much about football, but I admire Joe Theismann because he is a Christian. And <clears throat> another fellow student of mine, his response that he kind of blurted out was this, he's not a Christian, he's a Catholic. So my friend stopped by, and he was upset. He wanted to know why somebody would say that. So he sat down, and I taught him the gospel. And I talked to him about what the church was. And after that was over, he wasn't upset anymore. He said, I'm going to think about this. And he was baptized a couple of weeks later. Now, I'm not saying that the way to start the conversation is with that kind of ham-fisted technique. He's not a Christian. He's, I don't know that I would have started it that way. But what was better? What that other student said or the other folks there who were horrified by it is who said nothing? I can tell you which one resulted in his being baptized into Christ. And it was that one. Oh, it's a painful thing to realize that you're outside of Christ and that you need to change. I know it's a painful thing, and it certainly was with Saul. Saul set out for Damascus, and he never really even arrived. Saul was mortally wounded on that road, he lingered on for about three days. And then he died. And there were some Christians, I suppose, who would have been, been misguided and would have approached him and would have said, uh, we, want to come, we don't want this Saul to die. We want to come for you. And they would have been wrong for that because Saul needed to die. Saul and Paul had very little in common. But Saul, well, all of this opened his mind and his heart. And it was part of the process. Number four, we want to talk very briefly about the message of the gospel that uh, Saul of Tarsus received. It's interesting that when Jesus appears to Saul of Tarsus that uh, he doesn't tell him what to do to be saved. He says, go to Damascus, and it will be told what you need to do to be saved. Now, there are a couple of reasons for that. Number one, this is in harmony with the overall pattern of the preaching of the gospel. The gospel is supposed to be a divine message that is given through human messengers. It's strange that today some folks say, the Lord's telling me what to do, and this is what I need to do to be saved. And number one, what, what he's telling them, he's contradicting what he said in the Bible. And number two, it contradicts the entire pattern, which is human messengers. And, and secondly, in a general sense, the problem with that is there's no need of it. The gospel, the gospel plan, the gospel commands had already been miraculously delivered to mankind through the apostle Peter on the day of Pentecost. 
having been given that divine revelation, all that's needed now is to say, here is what we were told. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 7. We have this treasure in earthen vessels, clay pots, that the excellency of the power may be of God, not of us. Clay pots, a treasure, clay pots. Let us never forget which one is valuable, the message or the messenger, the clay pot or the treasure. We're clay pots, the gospel is the treasure. Nothing more than that. Now, when Saul was confronted with this vision. It's interesting that he calls him Lord, but he asks him who he is. Wayne Jackson in his commentary suggests that the word kurios is used here. Really, uh, you shouldn't attach any real significance to it, that it simply is similar to the use of sir. I myself dispute that. I don't think that he said that just in order to be polite. Nonetheless, I certainly will have to concede he didn't know to whom he was talking. Did he think it was God himself? I don't know. I doubt that he thought it was an angel because presumably Saul of Tarsus as a student of the Old Testament understood that he ought not to worship an angel. But nonetheless, once his identity had been established, it seems that Saul was going to make an immediate change. And we've already talked about the opening of his heart, but it's interesting that that change has to do with the authority of Christ, an authority that he has continually and consistently disputed up until this very point in time. But when Jesus says, I am Jesus whom you persecute, he says, Lord, what do you want me to do? That's a statement of authority. That's a statement that says, Lord, you have authority. I need to submit to you. What do you want me to do? You know what else? You know what else? Right here with this question, you can erase the damnable doctrine of Calvinism. Because if Jesus had been a Calvinist, he would have said, do? Do? Well, it's already been done. If you want a religious saving experience, try top uh, Saul's on the road to Damascus, huh? I've heard some of these experiences. I've even heard tales where somebody wanted to get into one of these churches and he didn't have a good enough experience and he, by his own admission, went home, made one up, and then that one they accepted. Somebody said one time about one of these churches, said you couldn't get in with the truth, but you got in with a lie. What's that tell you about your church? Try to top Saul's on the way to Damascus, will you? Now, if... We are saved as a result of God's direct intervention by the Holy Spirit that overwhelms us whether we want it or not. The Holy Spirit to a Calvinist sounds like an audit to me, an IRS audit. You, know, you just get it and you don't know it's coming and, and you didn't want it, it just hit you. Try to top Saul's. But that's not what saved him. But he, he, he had this experience and that his attitude changes as he says, Lord, what do you want me to do? And that question, that question got answered. Just like that question gets answered every time it's asked in the pages of the New Testament. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 37, men and brethren, what should we do? They got an answer, didn't they? The Philippian jailer in Acts chapter 16, verse 31. What, sirs, what must I do to be saved? He got an answer, didn't he? Believe on the Lord Jesus. They took him the same hour of the night, baptized him. Nicodemus didn't even get to ask the question. He just said, we know that you're a teacher come from God. And Jesus said, here's what to do. Everybody gets that question answered, except in modern day religions. They don't get it answered because nobody believes that there is anything to do. Isn't it interesting that a writer like Paul is twisted and abused today more than any other New Testament writer to support the idea that people are saved by grace only apart from obedience. That's interesting to me on a number of fronts. Number one, again, because of the question Paul asked or Saul asked. And secondly, because as he reports it in Acts chapter 26 and verse 19, his wording was, I was not disobedient. Now, it's interesting for a third reason. 
Because as Saul is converted and then eventually becomes gospel preacher and the apostle Paul, he then takes the message and preaches it to other people who have the option to either obey it or disregard it. Now, while Jesus was omniscient, as we suggested at the very beginning, and knew that this incident would be productive, uh, Paul didn't have that privilege. So he ends up preaching to people who reject his message, people like Agrippa in Acts chapter 26, verses 28 and 29. We said, you almost persuade me to be a Christian. And Paul's response was, I would to God that you were not almost, but altogether such as I am, except for these chains. So here was somebody who had the option to disregard the gospel. Calvinists don't believe they do. One more interesting part of the gospel message of Saul, and that's this. It is presumed that his accepting of this message will change his life. And that was stated, as I pointed out a few moments ago, in the explanation God gave to Ananias. Here's what he's going to become. And that is what he became. It presupposed that there would be a change in his life. I've mentioned a couple of times today the possibility that there were other people who were in a similar position as Saul, yet who were not converted and God knew they would not be converted. Let me suggest to you today that there are some who could do great things for the Lord, but they never will. They never will. They'll not change. There are others who say, I want to become a Christian, they're baptized into Christ, but they never really change either. That's a tragedy. When Saul became Paul, he never looked back. Right here in the very chapter that tells us initially of his conversion, in chapter 9 and verse 20, the Bible says he preached. This was in Damascus. Jesus was the Christ. Saul to Paul. It was a death to a life. In Romans chapter 6, verses 6 and 7, as Paul is discussing this very, prophet, this very process, he says, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin should be destroyed, that we should not serve sin, Verse 7, he says, we're dead. This afternoon, we're going to sing a song of invitation to invite you to become a New Testament Christian. If you are not a New Testament Christian, I remind you that this same, this same person, Saul, once received a message from a human messenger that was consistent with the message of salvation preached throughout the New Testament, and that was, why are you waiting, or why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized, wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord, Acts chapter 22 and verse 16. If you're outside of Christ this morning, why don't you respond to that invitation while we stand and sing? Would you